Get wrecked. Get a hit, Crash. Shut up. <laughs> all right, you've seen all his pitches. You've seen them all. Just shorten up, Crash. Now bring me the gas, kid. Bring me the gas. Bring me the gas. Ron, I'm so glad you came here to talk about sports movies uh, for a number of reasons. First, you've made more terrific movies about sports than any other director. Your vision of how to do a sports movie is to put as much of American life into them as you can. And third, you've been an athlete yourself, so each of your films brings that special perspective to their subject. I'm just happy to be here and hope I can help the ball club. <laughs> I was really curious about uh, you growing up really with an athletic identification first, more than a movie-loving identification. And when you knew that you loved movies and when the idea of a sports movie actually entered your consciousness. I grew up going to movies rarely when I was small. And in high school, I started to go every week because the goal was to sneak into the theater without paying. And my buddy and I would sneak in and we'd see anything. As long as we snuck in, that was the victory. And gradually, I got hooked about what we were sneaking in to see. But over the course of watching movies, Babe Ruth's story and Pride of the Yankees and others nobody's heard of, Rhubarb the Cat, all sports movies, I didn't like any of them, honestly. Uh -huh. And I was afraid to admit that because everybody liked them all. This was just sort of simmering inside me for a long time that when is somebody going to make a good sports movie? What was it about Pride of the Yankees especially, which is held up still as one of the great sports movies? Well, it's a good movie about dying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not much about sports. And if you know anything about Lou Gehrig, it's not much about Lou Gehrig. Uh -huh. And if you know much about the Gehrig-Ruth uh, relationship and rivalry, which is really fabulously complex, it doesn't go there. And it's terrible about baseball. So what's left? What's left is that Gary Cooper is very compelling and a great star, and he makes that speech. People all say that I've had a bad break. But today, today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Look, at it's populist, fair, great. Let's just not call it a sports movie. What was Rhubarb the Cat? Rhubarb the Cat was the lucky cat that lived in the bowels of Ebbets Field. Whenever he showed up, the Brooklyn Dodgers won. And they got a winning streak. They got into the playoffs against their hated rivals, the New York Giants. And the Giants kidnapped the cat so that they wouldn't have their lucky cat. Then the whole thing was, will he escape and get back to the game in time? And of course, he does. <laughs> when you were in college, there, and I think probably in high school and college, there, it was a period when there were these new films with sporting heroes coming out. The Hustler, Loneliness, the Long Distance Runner, The Sporting Life. Did you know there was something different about them? Did they, you know, ring truer to you when you saw them? Yeah, those movies all hit me yeah. hard, in, in a great way. They made me want, want to go to more movies. I mean, The Hustler remains maybe my favorite sports movie ever. Why do you say that? First of all, it's about competition the way it really is. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's a blood sport for these guys, and it's a blood sport for many men. Mm -hmm. And it is the playing fields of Eton instead of war. But it's just as brutal. And the sporting life, even though, look at that whole Lindsay Anderson and all those guys in England, that kitchen sink school, that's about as far from where I was living in Santa Barbara as possible. But I knew there was something about the athlete's relation to the sport and his need to compete that was more real than the other sports movies. What is it that distinguishes this, the athlete's sense of what it means to compete from the fan's sense of what it means to compete? Why the athlete needs to compete uh, it is something that's internal to certain men and certain women, but you never quite understand it, but you have to do it or you die. And competing honorably is almost more important than winning, but to the fans and to the press and everybody else, it's about winning always. Right. And I mean, look at the end of The Hustler. Is it about winning? Is it not about winning? In the sporting life, I mean, this guy is so battered and he gets up and what does he do? Where does he find solace? Back on the playing field. Chase! 
most athletes are like that. Mm -hmm. The world only makes sense to them on the playing field. Yeah, and there's a certain level of expertise that they flatter you into think you have. Like in The Hustler, he, he goes and he inspects, by the way, he goes into Ames pool hall and he says, Church of the Good Hustler. Oh. <laughs> I stole it and I didn't know it. <laughs> and then he feels the table and he has a, a nice pocket drop. And I have no idea what nice pocket drop means, but the idea that Paul Newman is saying it with such authority, yeah, it makes me feel that there's uh, yeah, some complexity to his involvement in the sport. There is, first of all. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, these are you know, art forms, whether we like it or not, yeah. the sports. And, and I think shop talk is great in a movie. Everything is understood among that group of people. Yeah. Sports is like that. And you, Larry Hockett, should recognize me, because five years ago in the Texas League, you were pitching for El Paso. I was hitting cleanup for Shreveport. You hung a curveball on a 0-2 pitch in a 3-2 game in the bottom of the eighth, and I tattooed it <laughs> over the Michelin tire sign and beat you 4-3. Yeah, I remember. I should have thrown a slider. Damn crash, how you doing? <sighs> to an athlete, in the dugout, in the locker room, in the buses, sometimes on the field, you are so exposed to each other, your failure. And the joking is ruthless. The teasing is ruthless. It is so politically incorrect that it's liberating. Also, baseball is the talking sport of all of them. And because the game has these wonderful rhythms, the guy who hits a double is talking to the shortstop on the other team all the time. There's all these conversations going on, right. which you couldn't imagine in another sport. Right, right. It wasn't like anything else. Yeah. So in my movies, I like to also Keep that alive. This guy's crazy. Yep. I wouldn't dig in there if I was you. Next one might be at your head. I don't know where it's going to go. I swear to God. <laughs> How important is it to get an actor who can be authoritative that way. It's tricky. Every actor thinks he's an athlete, and, and they aren't, most of them. And uh -huh. every athlete wants to be an actor, and believe me, they aren't. So it's very hard. And you know, I, I can tell a baseball player when they walk in the room, because I just flip my baseball. And a baseball player will rub the ball in a certain way. Or if there's an audition, put it on the table. A baseball player is so happy to have something in the room that he's comfortable with, they don't walk over and get it. You know, okay, hire him. I don't need even to read lines, you know. So, but it's tricky. Golf is very tricky, too. Golf is probably the hardest of all because a golf swing is impossible to make look good. Mm -hmm. And so you have to start writing into the script. Okay, the follow-through isn't perfect, so that's because he's playing in the winds of Texas where you shorten the follow you know. You have to do all that. We're talking to Carson about Tin Cup with Kevin Costner. Is Costner the best athlete you've worked with? Yeah, he is. He was a very good athlete. This guy starts me off with a breaking ball. I'm taking him downtown. I dare you to throw me the hammer. You ain't that stupid. Stepping up to the plate for Durham, our own Crash Davis. Come on, put your hands together for Crash. Let's hear it. Let's go. Come on, mate. Bring me that weak ass shit, huh? Bring it, bring it, bring it. Now you're in college and you're, uh, you're playing ball. You're playing basketball and baseball. Yes. And um, and you're also an English major. And I know you're really taken with. Uh, and British literature and American literature. And I was wondering if some of the literary antecedents start to come into your head then, any kind of figures from literature, the way uh, great writers treated sportsmen, like Hemingway or Fitzgerald, things like that. It was unconscious at the time. Uh -huh. uh, I liked to play with words and I liked language. I had no idea I was ever going to be a writer, much less a filmmaker. You know, I discovered Ring Lardner and some of those guys who wrote about the earthiness and the profane. But Looking back, you realize that Hemingway and the athlete and <laughs> whether it's the bullfighter or, mm -hmm. you know, Fitzgerald and Gatsby, Jordan Baker's professional golfer, 
You know, Gatsby probably his original sin was being involved with Meyer Wolfsheim, who fixed the World Series. I mean, so these sports themes have been really part of great American literature, and uh, because it's part of the American you know, social fabric. And, yeah. So from college, you spend five years in the minor leagues, and I'm intrigued by the idea of uh, you going on your off days to the movies, seeing what's there. It wasn't off days. It was game days, which yeah. are every day. I mean, you, uh -huh. you don't have off days in the minors. That's the whole point of it. Uh -huh. I think we had two off days in the entire Texas League for eight months or something, and so you're, you're sort of dying, it's, which is why we flooded the field to try to get an off day. Uh, the scene that shows up in Bull Durham. <laughs> <laughs> we got ourselves a natural disaster. Now keep in mind, even if it's the town you're playing for, in my case, Stockton, California, or Rochester, New York, or Clearwater, Florida, or that's not your hometown. So your your home is a temporary apartment, and then the other 75 days you're on the road playing in other towns. So I would go to movies. Mm -hmm. The movie would be at one, be over at three, three thirty, you take the a taxi to the to the ball, you'd be there for. Plus, it was air conditioned. So I went every day to a movie, regardless of the rating, uh, the review, good, bad. I just went to movies, mm -hmm. which is the best way to go to movies, because I didn't know what anybody thought. I knew I was just letting it wash over me. Yeah. In a year in the Texas League, I remember being completely intrigued by uh, somebody named Brian De Palma. His early movies, was it Hi Mom? Hi Mom, yeah. Hi Mom, and these players were outraged, and I said, no, it's a movie, it's not... The ballplayers are very literal, which is one of the most endearing things about them. You know, it's a movie. The 1970 Dallas-Fort Worth Spurs hated that movie. <laughs> so one thing I'm curious about before we leave this period is, um, uh, I think once you mentioned that you were playing in Stockton, and you went to see Fat City, John Huston's great boxing movie about down and outers in Stockton. I'd read Leonard Gardner's book, mm -hmm. and now I'm in Stockton and reading about these migrant workers, and and I was a boxing fan already. Mm -hmm. So this book was just perfect for me. And then I was still in Stockton the next year, and the movie came out, and I went to see it, and it kind of blew me away. And I thought that's the kind of movie that I like more than other kind of movies. That mm -hmm. I, I know those people mm -hmm. in the movie. Yeah. And it's not the fairy tale sports movie. To me, a kind of new thing maybe coming into movies around that time, you have movies like Fat City, Downhill Racer, some of the rodeo movies like Junior Bonner. I mean, there is there something about this kind of more human scale respect for just the guy doing the job? Well, this is the 60s, and this is when all the mythologies are being reorganized yeah. and the establishment and the establishment mythologies being kind of knocked down. Vietnam had a lot to do with it, um, where you suddenly couldn't believe your government anymore. Right. So I think that started paving the way for movies about real people just trying to survive, and survival became the victory. Yeah. yeah. Um, and later, the great fairy tale Rocky, you know, his victory survival, he didn't win. Right. But Fat City and Downhill Racer and all these other movies are, I think, grounding people to characters they identified with more in the 60s. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, the, a, a fairy tale would have got laughed off screen in yeah. the 60s. I mean, actually, now that I think about it, Downhill Racer, Robert Redford's sort of playing the golden boy, the great natural talent, but the whole movie is geared to make us question, what's the big deal when he wins? <laughs> right. Yeah. Another theme of these movies is uh, the idea that there's a limited time to when you are an athlete or a champion. I, I think it's it's the unstated theme in almost every sports movie. Mm -hmm. The clock is ticking. Uh -huh. So obviously it's a metaphor for the big clock, but and you don't have to make speeches about it. Crash Davis, how long are you going to keep doing this? We know, we see it on his face and everything he says and does that maybe I'm staying too long. And that, you know, God has given you, or luck has given you, genes and mental capability to be an athlete for that long. And I think that's the universal 
thing about good sports movies is it's over soon and you don't have to say it. Thanks. And hey, Nuke. Good luck. You too. Me. <laughs> when did you come around to thinking you might write and direct movies? I was married and had two children in my first marriage, and uh, I would start writing screenplays, and the first couple I was smart enough to throw away so they'll never be discovered. Uh -huh. um, there weren't any classes in screenwriting. Um, there weren't any books about how you do it. So I was just trying to stare at these movies in the theater and figure, how is this structured? Why does that one work and that one not work? Was it in the back of your mind when you got enough clout to do it, you would really do it? You'd do the sports film that had the stuff from the sports films you liked? I thought I'd do political movies. Under Fire, yeah. first, and then The Best of Times I wrote, and I couldn't direct it because I had no credits. I wanted to direct it. And I thought the only way I'll get a movie off the ground is if I write a script that every financier and studio has to say, well, at least you know more about this subject than anybody. And that was the genesis of Bull Durham. So with the, all these various movies, is this your take on it? But do you try to be conscious of what other people did? Like with boxing, when you did Play It to the Bone, did you think back of Rocky and Raging Bull and those kinds of things and wonder what was different to do about them that you could do? I didn't think much of it other sports movies. I just tried to make yeah. mine. I, I knew that big games weren't the solution. Uh -huh. Or if there was a big game, it had to be complicated. Right. And, and, uh, the victory had to be complicated with a loss. Right. You win the game, you lose the girl. You win the girl, you lose the game. You're not going to have both in my movie. Because you talk to a lot of athletes who win the Super Bowl, the big fight, and there's this whole postpartum thing. Then they go into this deep depression. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's all there is? <laughs> I have to do it again. So I, I just wanted to be about the doing of it, the stuff of it, the commitment of people like these low-level boxers and play it to the bone. Mm -hmm. That was really where it was coming from. <laughs>